I'd like to get started with uh, Joel Salatin, Elizabeth Rich, and Patricia Foreman here, and have each of you give a more broad uh, introduction of yourself and let the audience know whatever it is that you would like them to know about yourself. You want to start with me? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Joel Salton, Polyface Farm, um, and we're in Virginia. Um, you know, if you want to know more about me and this topic, you can get my book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Uh, <laughs> but we've, you know, we've pushed the envelope. Um, I, I, guess, I guess the thing you have to understand is when I wanted to come back to the farm uh, full time after high school, we always milked a couple cows. We always made butter, cottage cheese, yogurt, all that stuff. And I realized I could hand milk 10 cows, Guernseys, and sell the milk at regular store prices to people in the neighborhood that I was already selling my eggs to. They would be happy, I would be happy. I could make a li full-time living with 10 cows on the farm. There was only one problem. It was illegal and I've not gotten over it yet. So I'm Elizabeth Rich, and my life's work is dedicated to the problem that Joel just described. I, I'm an attorney. I live in Wisconsin on a 40-acre farm where I raise goats. I am trying to get a cheese facility licensed, and I've been trying to do that for the last three years. Even as an attorney, it's proved extremely difficult. There's just, and it's not that, it, it's just, there's just this huge layer of bureaucracy, and that's really why I, we bought the 40-acre farm in the first place, was I was working at a large firm in Milwaukee for large corporations, and I realized at that point how corrupt our governmental agencies were, that my, my wealthy, large clients could get their way with the EPA, the FDA, the USDA, and in many cases, it was their, exec their executives who were in charge of these government agencies. And that's when I told my husband about it and we decided we needed to buy our own farm to raise as much of our own food as possible because we couldn't trust the food supply. So now I work for the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund where we promote the interests of and advocate for small family farms who are, who are using sustainable uh, farming systems and serving their local food communities. Wow. I'm, I'm Pat Foreman. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pharmacist and I'm an animal scientist. I have degrees from Purdue University and, I'm, and a master's in public affairs. And I'm appalled at the state of our health in our nation of individuals. Uh, I don't understand why we don't have optimal health on the table in our disease management uh, mm. system. And um, I'm, the books that I write and, and the, the, I truly believe in my heart and soul that you have a right to raise and grow food that you eat on your land. It should be an inalienable right that has absolutely no contest whatsoever. And I've been doing a lot with the Gossamer Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to global sustainability and local foods. We believe that without local foods, we can't have global sustainability. So I guess I'm a local foods activist and want to talk about optimal humans instead of just barely functioning sometimes and uh, food rights. Okay, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our questions. Uh, and the very first question is, what do you do if a regulator shows up at your farm? Well, shall I take that one? The first step, the first question, the first inquiry is um, whether you have any government permits or not. Um, if you don't have a government license or a permit, then they need, a, they, they need a warrant, and you don't have to let them on if they don't have one. There's some limited exceptions to that, mainly that have evolved under the drug laws if they think, uh, you know, if, if they've seen you uh, snag the deer illegally and drag it onto your property. There's, there's some limited exceptions to that, but for the most part, if you're, the kinds of entry that we're talking about, where they want to find out about your chickens or your eggs or your... Um, or, or your beef, they need a search warrant. So that's the first question. Do you have a warrant? And if you don't have one, then 
no, you can't come on my property. And our, our members have a hard time with that because they tend to be law-abiding citizens and it's kind of hard to say no to somebody wearing a badge, but say no. Or call us. We have a hotline 24-7 and you can get a lawyer on the phone and the lawyer on the phone will say no. That's what I was going to say is, is my first <laughs> response is call Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Um, of course, that assumes that you joined earlier, um, but, but uh, you know, our experience with the regulators as they, as they come on um, is they, they don't make appointments and they just assume that they have carte blanche freedom to look and see and ask. Remember, you know, you don't have to answer any question. You don't even have to answer a question, I think I'm right, on, in, in a courtroom. Right. You certainly don't have to answer a question on your farm just because there's a, you know, a nice looking man or a nice looking woman standing there asking you questions doesn't mean you have to answer. And it also doesn't mean that they are actually there in a non-agenda driven doesn't mean that they're, they're your friend, even if they're smiling. <laughs> and, um, and so we, our routine policy is um, if they don't have a warrant, they haven't made an appointment, they haven't given us the, you know, the respect of, 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 an, of um, letting us put them in our schedule, <laughs> um, then they're not welcome. And we just tell them to leave. And amazingly, sometimes that's the last time you see them. They, they actually don't come back, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, I wanted to take this opportunity to ask you to share a story with the audience about uh, a farm-to-table event that one of the clients was at. Do you know which one I'm talking to? I do, which, yeah. Okay. I think you're talking about Quail Hollow yes, thank in you. Nevada. Those are, that, this member of ours had um, planned a very elaborate farm-to-table event in Nevada. It was, for, it was a private event for members of their CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, so it was not advertised to the public. The health department got wind of it and showed up at the event, and, this, and they had a licensed um, mobile kitchen, certified commercial kitchen with a chef that they had hired for the event and everything had been meticulously planned and done in accordance with applicable laws. Um, a health department agent showed up and they let, her, they let her on and she presented them with a list of six violations which after we had an opportunity to examine them later we could determine, go through them one through six, there is absolutely no legal validity to any of the alleged violations. And we find this is more often than not the case when an inspector shows up and says, you're in violation because your floor is not concrete or your eggs aren't pasteurized. More often than not, either they're legitimate, either they're unwittingly mistaken or they're just making it up as they go. Um, so this inspector had a list of six alleged violations and she told um, our startled clients that they had to dispose of the food. And they said, well, could we feed it to our pigs? No, you have to pour bleach on it. And it was beautiful, a beautiful pork creation that the chef had done for the 50 guests. And they did pour bleach on it. And, and then they remembered the kitchen magnet that we give out to our members that has um, our hotline number and they called because she was still there harassing them. And uh, she got in the, so they got a hold of one of our lawyers and he said, ask her if she has a warrant. And the woman was kind of shy because, you know, not used to dealing with authority. And she said, um, my attorney says to ask whether you have a warrant. And she did not have a warrant. So then the lawyer said, then tell her she has to leave. Um, my lawyer says that you have to leave. <laughs> and she did leave. She stormed off and came back with a deputy sheriff. And they called the lawyer again. And the lawyer said, does she have a warrant? And she did not. And so um, then he said, then she has to leave. And the deputy said, yeah, you know, I, without a warrant, I can't enforce any kind of entry on this property. So she stormed off in a huff. And the, the happy ending to the story, but she had no authority to, the bottom line is she had no authority to come on. And when told to leave, she had to leave. And bringing the deputy doesn't change the Fourth Amendment. You still need the warrant. 
Um, and then the happy ending to the story is that the, uh, the members, the CSA members went out into the field and gathered vegetables and brought them back and the chef on the spot whipped up some sort of beautiful creation and they got to sit down and have their nice dinner after all. And then, they, uh, then, then the members went to lobby their Congress people and they got a law passed in, well, their state representatives, and they got a law passed in Nevada so that that would never happen again. You know, the, 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 big, the biggest um, uh, kind of epiphany people have, a lot of times people think that I'm unnecessarily, unnecessarily harsh on the regulators or unappreciative or, um, you know, conspiratorial, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but I'll tell you, um, until one shows up on your doorstep with the big badge, you know, like the FBI, the big badge, and tells you, I'm going to confiscate your farm products, that, that feeling that goes over you of, of your dreams, your, your entrepreneurial, whatever, ambitions, you know, to have a business, it, it it, it, it's a it's a it's an unspeakable consuming whatever thing in, in, in your in your being to to say that it's all going to be uh, uh, gone and um, and and if that's if that's never happened to you so many people in our country um, you know we we've been taught to obey we've been taught to respect authority and all that sort of thing. Um, And so our first inclination is to assume that the person with the credentials, the person with the badge, means well or is there to protect us or, you know, has a real, whatever, societally affirming mission, you know. And until that's happened to you, I just don't believe it's impossible to appreciate the 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 level of emotional, mental, and spiritual angst that happens when that happens. It's very true, and it, it happened to me, and I'm glad it did because it helped me appreciate where my clients are. When I got a letter several years ago, two-page, single-space letter from the state um, accusing me of selling raw milk, which I don't because I have a huge target on my back, you know, <laughs> but... So I wasn't even true. I wasn't even yeah, yes yet. You do. Yeah. yeah, you do. <laughs> so they said, you know, we have evidence that you are selling raw milk, and this is, uh, you know, this can subject you to severe criminal and civil penalties. And it went on and on. It was scary. And I felt I hit what Joel's describing. I felt this visceral, sick feeling mm -hmm. in my stomach that, oh my gosh, they got me. They got me. You know, <laughs> I wasn't even doing it. <laughs> We got, a, we got a call from a, one of our chefs. We service about 50 restaurants. A couple, a couple years ago, um, chef called us in a panic. He said the health department was just here and threw out their eggs, said they were illegal to sell. Oh, and, um, well, I mean, we service 50 restaurants. If they're illegal to sell to that restaurant, they're certainly illegal to sell to the one down the street and the one down the street and the other one. <clears throat> and so um, I asked him, I said, give me the name of the, of the health department official and the the alleged code violation. She'd already taken the eggs and thrown, thrown them out. I mean, confiscated them. And, um, and so he gave me the, the two, the, her name, phone number, and the alleged code violation. I hung up with him, immediately called Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Pete Kennedy answered the phone. And I said, Pete, here's my situation. It was, it was less than a 60 second phone call. He, he said same thing, give me the name, give me your number, give me the code violation. Within 24 hours, the health department apologized, said they were wrong, it was all okay, and they had overstepped their, their bounds. How long do you think it would have taken me, as a dumb farmer, to get that level of concession from the government bureaucracy, ever, ever. And so this is why I'm in a love affair with Farm and Consumer Legal Defense Fund. We have used them several times already. I anytime you're trying to do something that's a little off plumb <laughs> and, and, and in, in local and artisanal 
and uh, whatever, self-reliant food systems, much of what we do is a little bit off plump, right? And, um, and, and we, you know, one of the things you learn in negotiation is equals have to negotiate with equals. And when I'm negotiating with the government attorneys and regulators, that's not equals. That's, that's peasant with, you know, whatever, uh, um, royalty or something, okay? It's not equals. And so when you bring up attorney to attorney, now you're equals. Now you can actually have a conversation. And we really, we really need to appreciate um, this, this principle in negotiation that, that equals have to negotiate with equals. I mean, this is why, this is why what, Pompeo met with Kim Jong-chol or whatever, and now Trump is gonna meet with Kim Jong-un, right? Whether you like it or whatever. What I'm saying is the, our society in negotiation, you set up to where equals can negotiate with equals. And, and, and this is a really important principle. And so for me, man, walking around with Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund in my hip gives me a lot of, of encouragement, uh, if not confidence, to push on some of these issues that otherwise would be intimidating. Yeah. It's, it's a real barrier. I want to want to just add. I'm a me I've been a member for quite a few years too, and 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 I've referred many people to the office saying, "Hey, it's a legal question, go." But just having that, and and I've been in front of city councils saying, "Well, we have representation with the legal defense from the consumer legal defense fund. Uh, we'll be back in touch with you." And they instantly go, "Oh, really? Yes, yes. Uh, give me your number, <laughs> and I'll refer you." To, and it really does have an effect. Just saying, there there's a watchdog there, and they've got legal smarts and they've got my backside. So I've, I've said things in public that I probably would be a little shyer about if it weren't for having my membership. <laughs> okay, well let's go ahead and uh, get to this list. Um, thank you though, so much for sharing your experiences. I think a lot of people can relate or be empowered by that, so I appreciate that. Um, so you mentioned that you had been accused of selling raw milk. Um, can you legally sell raw or unpasteurized milk, and how do you know if your state does have regulations on that? Yeah, the regulations are, there's a, a federal ban on shipping milk across state lines, but when you're talking about sales that are happening strictly within a state, that's governed on a state-by-state -state basis, and the, the laws vary widely by, in each state. We, at, on our website, farmtoconsumer.org, we have various maps. There's one for raw milk regulation, for poultry processing, for meat processing, and our newest one is cottage food laws. And you can go and find your state and click on the state and then it will, uh, and then and scroll down and there'll be an explanation of the details regarding regulation in, the, in your particular state because it is very different in each state. And then what about if you were wanting to sell meat directly to a consumer? Similar, yeah, we have, so um, in general, meat, meat regulation is governed by USDA on a federal level, and that's, that's something that I perceive and many in our organization perceive as problematic. So since Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle back in 1905 and 1906, we responded with, uh, with rules that were designed to correct what were at the time some real problems with large Chicago slaughterhouses. The problem is that, and then in 1967, we refined those laws and made them even more strict with the Wholesome Meat Act. And what's, what that's done is really um, cause a drastic decline in, small, in the ability of small meat processors to survive. And there's fewer and fewer every year. Huge crisis, we see them, our, our members are going out of business, and Joel, I know, can speak to this as well, but it creates a hardship for farmers because they can't find a place to get their animals processed. It creates a hardship for the animals because they're being transported long distances under very stressful situ circumstances. And it creates a hardship for consumers because if you can't find a USDA processor and you use a, then, then you can't, you've got to purchase a live animal, either a whole animal or a half or maybe a quarter. 
and that means you have to be wealthy enough to shell out that kind of money and you have to be wealthy enough to have the freezer space to store that, that quantity of beef. So it's a problem all around. We, it does vary state by state and you can find your state in that same interactive map on our website, but the bigger picture is we need to fix this broken system. And Joel can speak more to the practicalities of that. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that, that um, I, I think the basis of this, um, you know, you were talking about every, every time the, uh, the Meat and Poultry uh, Wholesome Foods Act has been amended, um, ha we've lost half of our community abattoirs uh, and canneries and things like that, right? Um, well, why is that? Well, it's because, this is what you need to understand, that the, the regulatory, in, in this sphere, the regulatory environment is highly scale prejudicial. And, and I would just throw out here that I think if there's one like litmus test for a bad regulation, it's when a bad regulation is one where it's much easier to comply if you're big than if you're small. Now, somebody will say, well, well give me an example of one that's, that is whatever, easy, both big and small. I'll give you one. The speed limit. It doesn't take any more effort to push the pedal of an 18-wheeler than it does the brake of a, of a Prius, okay? That, that, that is a regulation that has no scale implications, all right? But, but the problem is right now with the food, the food safety um, regulations is that they're highly uh, a concessionary, concessionary and favorable toward large producers and discriminatory or prejudicial against small producers, and therein lies the rub. That's why every time there is a revamping of the system and tightening of the loopholes, we lose half of our community, our small, we're not losing half of our big ones, we're losing half of our small community abattoirs. You can just see the numbers uh, plummet. And we have, we've got 80% or more of our beef market nationwide controlled by four companies. So, and, and it just keeps, with each consolidation, they get more right. and more market share. And in 1906, when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, only 50% of America's beef was controlled by seven companies, and they said that was a monopoly. <laughs> so in, in, in 1906, it was, I'm, if I'm not right, I'm close. 50% uh, <laughs> was seven companies. Today, 80% is now down to three companies, and that's considered free market. I, I mean, it's <laughs> the, 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 the language has certainly changed. And of course, those three companies can't possibly accommodate anything like a local no. food economy. So if we want to promote that, we right. have to change that. And, and, the, and we need laws that support it. So there is a federal law, the PRIME Act is the acronym, um, right. and if you contact your federal representatives, we, we'd like you to support that, because that, it's not a panacea, but at least it gives states, states like mine, Wisconsin, are never gonna, they're not, they're not gonna stop doing what they do, but some states will promote small farm or small ag, and the PRIME Act gives them the opportunity to do that, because right now USDA just has an iron fist on these regulations. Okay, um, moving along, what is the responsibility if you have a customer that gets sick after consuming your meat or dairy? Um, you wanna start? Oh, or go ahead. I, you know, my feeling as an attorney is that this is uh, kind of, there's strict liability and there's negligence, and under either analysis, you're responsible. If you're gonna produce food, then you're responsible if somebody gets sick. And some you know, people come to a lawyer and say, well, can you draw up um, a liability release or an assumption of risk agreement? And I say, sure, I can draw it up. You know, but the fact is, those are disfavored by the courts and it's not likely to hold up. It's, it's going to, because, because the fact is, um, the courts are gonna expect that if you produce the food, you take responsibility for the food and that's what your customers are gonna expect as well. Yeah, it's an expectation thing. Um, so, so th I would say the first, the first thing is to realize that, um, that, that 
and in, in a small local transparent food system, there's not much between my customer and me. Uh, there's no a bunch of, uh, you know, Philadelphia attorneys on retainer to protect me. And so that in and of itself makes me more careful. I can assure you, having watched at federal inspected plants process poultry especially, ours is way cleaner uh, because we don't process every day, we don't process very many, you know, uh, and, and they come in from the field clean. They're, they're not coming in with their feathers completely um, whatever, uh, uh, um, encrusted with fecal particulate, all right? So, so, so just the, the nature of them coming in cleaner. So I, I think that there is a lot of safety just in local, arti you know, uh, uh, direct, transparent uh, consumer to, producer to consumer uh, sales has that, um, that, that necessary relationship. Uh, beyond that, of course, you know, we have, a, we have liability insurance. Um, I don't mind giving a plug to Farm and Family Insurance. Uh, they've, we've found them to be the most um, uh, 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 open to kind of pushing the envelope on some of these things. And so we have a, we have a product liability uh, policy uh, if somebody does um, get sick. We've never had anybody get sick, but um, you know, uh, there's always time for a first time. And we, you know, because we are small, um, you know, we can watch things up a little better you know, because, because we're there. We're not, we're not you know, a thousand people um, in a big plant not knowing what the left hand is doing, you know, we, we can kind of see what's going on. So there's, there's a level of protection there that's, that's powerful. Uh, I, I, I would just add one other thing. It's interesting today with the democratized, with the democratized internet, um, there's a lot of thought that the, the regulatory environment that we currently have that developed out of 1906 um, and came through the industrial revolution, the industrialization of food, as you know, razor wire fences and 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 opaqueness developed in the food system. There's a lot of thought that we needed this very large industrial type regulatory environment to control this large opaque industrial, you know, food environment. And that and that the the embedded butcher baker and candlestick maker who were vetted by their village because everybody knew who the good ones were and who the skull flaws were by, by the nature of, of the inherent localization and village voice of 500 years ago, that that is now being replaced by the uberization of the democratized internet feedback loop. And so is it possible that today's village conversation of the butcher baker and candlestick maker 500 years ago is being replaced by the chat room, the rating systems, and the uberization of the democratized internet with the global voice that we can now have to replace that. And so that is making for, for, for the embedded butcher baker and candlestick maker in the local food system, that is making obsolete the very opaque industrial scale regulatory environment on, on that sector of the food system. Did you want to weigh in? I can't say anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Pat, I do have one for you. So if you have come into an issue with zoning laws and you want to have chickens or you already do have chickens, what should you be doing about that? That's, that's a very common question. <laughs> that, that, and and I, I'm pleased to say I think we've made quite a bit of advance over the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, it's getting a lot easier to uh, uh, talk to people. Chickens are getting more acceptable and there's an there's a experience level across all the states that they're just not a problem. We're talking about urban flocks at this point. So, so that's, that's really good. Um, it's not completely over. There, there, it's gone, I think, from out and out war in some communities <laughs> to more of a battle and a discussion. But um, having said that, there, there are still communities that uh, it has to proceed election by election. And you just get a, you have to get new city council members or a new mayor or new advocates in. So you can wear them down. That, and and that, that the long term, and we, we have that. There, there was one town um, that literally had been working on it for, gosh, probably 12 years. And it's a whole new everything. And, and the, uh, they're more amicable to it now, but we'll, we'll see where it goes. It only takes one official 
or a sheriff or someplace, someone that's vocal and they'll overstep their boundaries and their personal opinion is that chickens are filthy, dirty and don't belong in the cities. It's a backward retrograde movement for civilization mm -hmm. to have chickens in the cities, but, but uh, that's, that's giving in. The, it was interesting because the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin, they had one of the first uh, national coop tours in the U.S. and one of the first uh, early chicken adoption laws. He literally came out. Uh, they required permits to begin with and, and uh, fees and no one was uh, getting the permits and they don't have a clue really how many chickens are out there, but there's no trouble. There, there's like very few animal, r animal responses, complaints. So he literally came out and he said, you know, the, the chickens are bringing us together as a community. It's no yoke. <laughs> and he meant it. Yeah. Uh, Pat, have there been any, you know, the, the, the fear is that they're, they bring disease, they're going to be dirty, they're vectors, vectors for it, right? What's the track record? I mean, my sense is that every village, every town, city that finally does a backyard chicken ordinance, mm -hmm. what, it, it, it gives credibility. To, to the next town that wants to do it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Is, is that track record continued to progress or have there been outbreaks, have there been problems? It is a domino effect. It's uh -huh. really good. We, we did a, a chick start. A dominicker, a dominicker effect? A dominicker <laughs> domino effect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one chicken follows another. <laughs> but we, the, uh, Richmond, Virginia uh, legalized chickens, family flocks. And then there was a, a home and garden show, the East Coast Home and Garden Show invited us to come and and they gave us two booths because to celebrate the legalization. So we got some of the hatcheries to donate some baby chicks and we did a chick start project, gave away 312 baby chicks to first time flock owners. And so there were little 312 peeps of light went out all across the Eastern seaboard. Peeps and today light. every single place there is legal except Virginia Beach. Uh. But it, that was a nice little spreading out. But as far as, um, uh, disease Increased vector disease or, or anything. Well, I think it's just the opposite mm -hmm. be because I, I do public displays of affection with my chickens. I have no fear of <laughs> giving them a kiss. And I think it's helping, um, helping people build their immune systems because we need certain. <laughs> Plus, the eggs are so healthy for and, and different from different human nutrition from some of the stories. So, um, but I, as far as anything adverse, I've not heard anything mm -hmm. about family flocks and. and uh, Right. And if, if they do have a question in the school programs we've worked with or, or in retirement centers, we just put a little hand sanitizer there that stinks like crazy, and um, eventually it just ends up in the trash, if I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> do you enjoy learning from our podcast guest? You may find our podcast friends at our various Mother Earth news fairs. There, you may visit their presentations and take a DIY project home from one of our many hands-on workshops and shop with over 300 vendors specializing in self-sufficiency and natural health. I and other members of the Mother Earth News staff enjoy visiting the fairs and meeting our readers, so keep an eye out for us and say hi. Because we consider you a friend, don't forget to use the link in the podcast for a friendly discount on your tickets. Find out more details and plan your trip to the fair at www.MotherEarthNewsFair.com. I look forward to seeing you there. Okay, and then moving on to some ruminants. If you are in a herd share, what right do you have to the products other than milk? And also, could you briefly explain what a herd share is? Sure. A herd share involves um, joint ownership of a milk-producing animal. In general, that's the general idea. And in all 50 states, it's legal to drink raw milk from your own animal. So in a herd share, we create the legal concept of ownership. So the, these people, there's different ways of setting it up, but the best way in order, to, um, in order to promote the legal concept that we're going for is that you have, an, you have your herd or your cow appraised and then everybody who's going to be a member of the herd share pays a share of, this, of that fair market value of the animal, so that they, and then we do a bill of sale so that they are a legal official owner. You don't necessarily have to jump through all those steps, but I'm just describing what gives me my best day in court if I'm defending that herd share. Mm -hmm. So the idea, though, is that everybody who's getting milk is getting milk from an, an animal or animals that they are an actual owner of, therefore making it legal even in states where it's not legal to sell or distribute raw milk. Doesn't count if you're the owner. 
So that's the legal concept behind a herd share agreement. When you talk about value-added dairy, now I'd like to take that milk and I'd like to make it into cream or yogurt or butter, and I'd like to provide that to my herd share members, it gets a little trickier. Um, there's some states, uh, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Maine that have um, put out food freedom legislation, and they've said if you, may, if you make it on the farm, you can distribute it to consumers directly from the farm. Uh, Minnesota also has a constitution that says if you make it on the farm, you can peddle it from the farm. The mm -hmm. Minnesota state officials hate that, and they keep, they keep challenging it over and over and over. They keep saying, yeah, but our law says it's illegal, and then we go to court and we say, yeah, but your constitution says it's okay, and the constitution trumps the statutes, but we have to keep doing that. They keep, they keep coming is, back. Is that a carte blanche thing? I mean, across the board, like to butcher chickens or? That the constitution. Yeah, in, in the constitution. That the, the, the peddling uh, from the farm? Well, yeah, peddling from the farm. No, because the hierarchy. Charcuterie, bologna. See, um, see, the hierarchy goes state law, state constitution, federal law, U.S. constitution. So we have the federal USDA laws that say you can't do the meat processing, and uh, that trumps the state constitution that says you can. But. Um, the tricky part about a value-added dairy is that except for those three states, maybe four states, that um, most states say if you're going to sell or distribute dairy products, you must prepare them in a dairy plant, a licensed dairy plant. And so it's a different deal. If you're selling, I'm a farmer, I'm going to have a herd share so my customers own my cow so they can drink milk from my cow. If I'm now making cheese, that's a different deal because um, you're not making the cheese, I'm making the cheese, and the law says if you're gonna make cheese and sell or distribute it, you have to do it in a licensed facility. So that's, so if you don't have a licensed facility, it's not quite the same thing. And it, it becomes a gray area. So is it okay for me to take milk from my cow and hence the herd share people take their milk and make it into cheese in their own kitchen? Yes. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end is, is it okay for me to take milk from the cow and make it into cheese? But now I'm gonna take the milk that my herd share members own and I'm gonna make it into cheese in my kitchen, which is not a licensed dairy plant. And I'm gonna give the cheese to them at a price and they're, and they're gonna pay me for my services for making their milk into cheese. They're gonna pay me service for my service and that service payment is gonna kind of be about the fair market value of the cheese. So now, you know, it's it, that probably not okay. There's things in the middle, you know. Is it okay, is it okay if um, Aunt Sally, who knows how to make cheese, comes to my house and takes my milk and shows me how to make it into cheese and we do it together? Yeah, that's okay. So you step, I've done this in depositions with regulators. We step down in increments, you know, down into, would that be okay? Well, yeah, that'd probably be okay. And then, okay, well now what if Aunt Sally takes my milk and we go to Aunt Sally's kitchen because she's got the equipment and we make it into cheese there. Is that okay? You know, yeah, no, it's probably okay. You know, you just, so, um, so if you find yourself in an enforcement situation because you're making cheese for your herd share, I'll, I'll work with you. You know, we'll, we'll try to figure it out. But the bottom line is it's, it's important to understand that doing, making up value added dairy is not the same concept as the herd share because of, these state requirements that it be made in a licensed dairy plant. Could the same thing be transferred like to, chick to flock share? Like could my customers buy chicks and then pay me a, a service fee to raise them? And then, and then I process them for free or we... Uh, and then you process yeah. for free and then they pay for... Well, for wait. services, they pay for the fact that I fed and watered them. So much a chicken. It, you know, that's going to, um, each state has a separate <laughs> poultry exemption law, and that's also on our website. You click on your state, so it's different for everybody. Um, and it would be, you know, I, I don't know. I could, <laughs> in Wisconsin. It depends. It depends. it depends. In Wisconsin, they're very strict about it. And it's a, we have the 1,000 bird exemption, but they say they must all be raised on the farm. So I actually had a case where father and son, you know, each wanted to raise, they, what, they had 2,000 chickens on father's farm, and they said, well, we're, it's a 1,000 bird exemption, and the, and the state regulars said no, because the law says they have to be raised on the, on the owner's property, 
and the son isn't the owner, so he can't have his thousand on dad's property. Could we, they rent? Could they rent the son? I say they could, and we actually, you know, that's, yes, because the, the rental, the, where this concept of ownership, the regulators get themselves all yeah. flummoxed up. Right. Because you can't say that renting is not a legitimate ownership interest. That's correct. Um, but they do. Mm -hmm. And if you push them on it, then they say, well, yeah, you say it's renting, but it's really a sham. That's what they always, that's what they always come back to. Yeah, it's not really an ownership interest because it's not really renting because it's really a sham to get around the law. And then you just have to duke that one out in court. I hope everybody's appreciating the, the fun, <laughs> the fun that sometimes can come with going, you, you got two, you got two kind of, two different uh, paths when you get hit with some of this, don't you? You've got the path of, but how hard is it to comply? Can, can we comply? And, and I think most of us, if that's the path of easiest, you know, easiest to do, we want, I mean, who wants a trouble, okay? But sometimes the easier path is to push it and actually creatively figure out a way of non-compliance that might be gray, but, but, but there, there's risk on both. You know, there's risk to borrow enough money to build a compliant plant and, and, and satisfy the bureaucrats every Monday morning when they come in and, oh, we interpret this room as purple this week. Next week, the room has to be green. And next week, the room has to be red. You know, they do that to you because the regulations are themselves gray. And so the, the moment you step down to saying, well, we're going to comply and we don't want any, you know, uh, uh, you know dealings or, or any of this gray stuff, that carries its own risk as to whether you can afford to continue. To, and those of us who've been in this a long time, we've watched people go out of business when the, the, the paperwork overheads and, the, and, and they just get a, a really stick in the mud inspector that just, you know, it's, it's, it's judge, prosecution, and jury, you know. And, and, and if you make the inspector angry, who yeah. there's uh, nothing worse than having an angry inspector, okay? And, and, and so, so there is, what I'm getting at is there is risk in both, sometimes in both compliance, and there's risk in non-compliance, and it's not always cut and dried on which path is the better approach. Right, and just to editorialize for a moment, wouldn't it be nice if the inspectors would say, hey, I understand what you're trying to do. Let's right. figure out a way to help you do it. So father and son... You know, our concern with the thousand bird limit is we don't want people producing many thousands of birds uh, without complying with certain regulations. But if it's father a thousand, son a thousand, that's really within the spirit of the rules. So let's figure out a way to right. help you do that. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, so building on that, if somebody wanted to raise chickens in the way that Joel does, what did they need to know about their state regulations? PL 9492. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they can just go to the interactive map. <laughs> or join find, if you join Farm to Consumer, you can call us and we'll give you unlimited consultations on these issues. But yeah, basically under the, the federal law, um, you can, some states, you can have no exemption and only allow what the, you know, only allow a USDA inspection or some states allow a 1,000 bird exemption. That doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Some states it does. Some states that means you can string it up on the clothesline and you know whatever you want. Um, but the the 1,000 bird exemption means it's state by state, and you have to comply with whatever rules your state puts in place for inspection or not. Right. And then there's a 20,000 bird exemption. Some states have that that as well as the 1,000 bird, and that's an, an additional layer, but it doesn't mean you're exempt from everything, it just means you're exempt from what your state allows you to be exempt from. The feds aren't, the feds are gonna let the states regulate it. Yeah, the, the public law 90-492 producer grower exemption is a federal exemption. Some states have just, whatever, I don't know what the word is, they've, 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 tra they've written it into their state code. What, adopted it. Adopted yeah. it into their state code. Other states, or more restrictive or whatever. But even within that, um, there are different interpretations of what sanitary and unadulterated means. And so, for example, one of our big, you know, our, one of our first great big showdowns was when the state said that an open air facility 
is inherently unsanitary. Tell them what the open air is. The open air means, means that you're slaughtering outside, not inside a building, but Joel's got stainless steel countertops set right. up outside and it's very, very clean we're operation. On a, we're on a concrete floor, um, but, but, but it's a shed. It, 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 you know, it's not in an in a enclosed uh, building. And, um, and, and you know, the inspector told us that the air, the air is inherently unsanitary so you can't butcher a chicken in the air, in, in the open air, and have it done in a sanitary. And, and the first guy that came and gave us our exemption number, number 1001 in Virginia, he saw what we were doing. He, he thought it was fantastic. He said, man, if I'd have known about this when I was a young guy, I might have stayed on the farm. He was that enthusiastic about what we were doing. And when he retired, the next guy comes and says, uh-uh, um, the law didn't change, nothing changed, just the person changed, and suddenly the interpretation was, every, was congratulations, you're doing great, to whatever, uh, uh, you're a criminal. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, it was that, that difference, and nothing changed in the code. And that, I think that's actually a constitutional problem. That's a due process problem. Due process entires, entitles us to notice and an opportunity to be heard. And when it's that arbitrary, when nothing changes except the person, and it results in complete disparate enforcement, that's, you know, that's, that's a constitutional problem we're having across the country with our meat regulation. Mm -hmm. Would that also be a grandfathered issue as well? Is there a... Grandfathering is zoning, um, that's zoning. more than more than okay. statutory okay. interpretation. Mm -hmm. All right. See, that's why you have. That's why you need attorneys <laughs> help you suss out the difference. Of <laughs> okay, we have one more question, and that is, if somebody is not a farmer, why should they maybe consider still being a member of Farm to Consumer Legal mm. Defense Fund? And then after that, we'd like to open questions to the audience. We have different categories of membership. So consumer members pay $50 a year. We have homesteaders um, who pay 75 a year. And then artisan produ food producers and farmers pay 125 a year. And what our consumer members are paying their $50 a year for is to support what we do as a group. So we not only support our individual farmers with um, legal consultation and, li and litigation assistance if need be, we represent them in court, but we also advocate across the country for change to these problematic legal systems that we've been discussing today. So that's so our consumer members are supporting those efforts as well as supporting their individual farmers so that if it happens to be their farmer that's targeted next, they help subsidize our organization's defense of those farmers. May I just add to that the why? You ask, you ask why should they? The why is that there just aren't enough farmers to carry the day. Um, you know, we're down to less than, less. we're down now to twice as many prisoners incarcerated in prisons as we have farmers in this country. Uh, arguably, you know, that, that gives, it, 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 it means that we just don't have any political clout anymore. And, and, and if things are going to change, yeah, some of us really, you know, heretic farmers can can push for change, but real change is gonna is gonna come from the consumer the consumer sector. That's where the political power is, and so um, don't cringe. But those who know me know that I'm very quick to say I'm dreaming for the day when the Farm and Consumer Legal Defense Fund is as powerful as the NRA. The, and, and and I'm an NRA member, so this is not against the NRA. All I'm saying is when Americans carry, care as much about food freedom as they do about ammunition freedom, we will have a different society and Monsanto, Tyson, and Cargill will not walk with such a swagger. Nice. Okay, so I'll take the second one first. <laughs> So the question was, is there a benefit for a homesteader to set up a limited liability corporation? A limited liability corporation is going to give anyone who sets it up protection against lawsuits segregating your personal assets from, uh, from assets of the farm. Is the homesteader going to be selling or they're just producing for themselves? 
Oh. Yeah. So this is a homesteader who's going to engage in agritourism. So definitely mm -hmm. a limited liability corporation would be a good idea for that person because you're going to have visitors coming to the farm. Um, as, as one farmer, uh, I know Will Winter said, you know, people get hurt. <laughs> they're going to fall. You can count on it. They're going to fall. They're going to stick like... You know, stick their finger in the turkey cage and get bitten because it looks like a worm. Something's going to happen. And so the Limited Liability Corporation will accept the income from the, the agritourism activity and also the liability so that if there is a lawsuit, you don't, your personal assets aren't at risk. So, yeah, definitely a good idea. Do you want to take the first question, which was the revolving Re door? Revolving, revolving door. Um, the revolving door is, is an, uh, whatever, it's the... There's going to be a revolving door as long as the federal government um, um, what am I gonna, uh, sticks its nose into all of our business. And, and um, as long as that's occurring, that's going to be the nature of the beast, in my opinion. Which, you know, you can either, look, I think you can, you can either say, let's change, let's change the government. We would just... Oh, things would be better if we had better governance. You know, all my all my socialistic friends. You know, my Bernie Sanders friends. Oh, if we just had better governance, it would all be okay. Well, how are we going to get there? I mean, you know, I mean, we, we we started out fairly good, and 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 here we are. So, what's going to change to make us have better governance? So, I'm done with it. I'm done with all that, and I'm for let's free up entrepreneurial, innovative bottom-up grassroots freedom from the we haven't tried that for a long time either okay let's free up freedom from the bottom up those guys can go play their games but you know what if nobody went to walmart we wouldn't have to worry about those big guys let's just cut them off at the knees and build a completely parallel universe that's based on integrity because people know each other how about trying that and so that's where I think Farm to Consumer is really, more than any other organization, is giving wings, it's giving, it's, it's giving fuel to the freedom idea instead of trying to change to, to get better people at the top. Let them go play their games. And let's create a different universe at the bottom. And we'll finally put them out of business from the bottom up. So the question is, what are the top five... <laughs> Um, errors that farmers in general make that can bring them down. So yeah, I got that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the number one error is um, failing to recognize corporate formalities, co-mingling your personal and your business. So in the spring when you're broke and you got to and your fencing, you got to repair your fencing and buy new fencing and buy seed and buy feed and the farm doesn't have the money for that, then you put, take the money out of this pocket and put it into the farm. And then in the fall, when you sold a bunch of animals or sold a bunch of crops and you got some money, then you take the money out of the farm and you stick it in your personal pocket. And now what you've done is you've created one big related entity mm. and you've, you've destroyed any protection that your lawyer created for you <laughs> in separating the two businesses. So that'd probably be number one. Um, Number two is um, not being careful, not, not choosing your business partners carefully mm -hmm. enough. So you have to look at each one, each vendor relationship, each um, business partner, you know, your spouse. It, <laughs> well, <laughs> that too, I'm just saying, yeah. Um, but you go into these relationships like you do in a marriage. You're all yeah, giddy yeah. and lightheaded, and, mm -hmm. and they, com they come into my office, and they're all excited about, you know, the possibilities, which is great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you don't get it, if you get a lawyer involved, you're probably okay because it's our job to look at what happens when everything turns to crap. That's mm -hmm. what we do. So then we're total downers, and we take these happy, enthusiastic people, and we say, well, have you thought about this and this and this? And you, we, depre we depress them. And it's just, <laughs> it's just kind of a necessary <laughs> evil. Um, you just have to have an exit plan with every relationship, yeah. including the spouse, too, maybe. <laughs> but I'm, ta I'm talking about business. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. if you're going to have... It's easier to start <laughs> than stop. 
much easier to start than stop, and you have to have that exit strategy. So, hey, you know, my nephew wants to raise pigs for me, and I don't have, I've got a market now that I've developed, and I don't have enough pigs, and he's going to do it. Great. But you have to think about, so what happens if, um, you know, if he decides he doesn't want to do it, or he moves away, or, or he drops dead of a heart attack? What, have we thought that through? Have we figured all that out? And, you know, usually the answer is no. So you want to try to work right. through those things. Right. Do you have a number three? I can keep going, but. <laughs> well, for, uh, yeah, uh, I was interested to see what you were gonna, uh, <laughs> my, my number, I, I agree with you, one and two. Number three, I would say, is probably um, just financial, uh, um, uh, spending too much, or, or, or too high expense or too low income, I mean, either one, but just financial stress, uh, not having capitalization and understanding cash flow. Uh, cash flow. Most businesses fail not because they don't have a good product or a good service or good people, but because the expenses are mounting faster than the income. They have to be paid first, and the next thing you know, you're 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 in a cash flow situation. Maybe cash flow yeah. would be and well, a business plan. How about that? Put it together a realistic yeah, a, a, a business real, plan. A real business plan. That would so, be number three. And and yeah. you know, there's a there's a goat farm in my Why don't you area. You say five. We're yeah. gonna, I've got to come up with five. Pet, you got to come up with number four then. But I have to finish on three. So in three, it's not just the little guys. We had this big goat farm. They're, they're going to have 10,000 goats, they decided, in Wisconsin. And they knew nothing about goats. So they put together a business plan that said they're going to um, they're gonna get 12 pounds of milk out of each goat. Any goat farmer out there knows how crazy that is. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been raising goats for 20 years. And if I've got an eight-pounder, that's a good goat. You know, so their business plan, 10,000 goats, 12 pounds each, and they were so, they were, they acquired so poorly that they wound up buying everybody's cull goats, and they're actually getting two and a half pounds right. per goat. Right. So they're going, those folks are going under. It's not just a small farmer thing. Maybe, maybe four would be, maybe four would be experience. Mm -hmm. You can't Google experience, so it's, it's overrunning your headlights. It's, it, it's, it's trying to grow too fast or, or have unrealistic expectations because you haven't, you haven't planted the carrots, you haven't milked the goat, you haven't done stuff. Um, uh, and, and so you, you kind of get beyond your, beyond your experience level. Over your skis, we would say, <laughs> get over your skis. All right, so we got four. Got Pat, five? Pat. I do have one. Fail it fast. If you're going down the road and, and you, you, you only get two, two gallons instead of 10, or you realize that you're skidding and you're just not making the, the cash flow, stop. Uh, just, just don't go down and end up in bankruptcy. Just, just oh, uh, stop. Huh, okay. Fail it fast. Better to, better to, 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 um, to punt <laughs> and maybe retreat yep. uh, better than just Start keep charging up the hill. Build yeah, up just it. retreat, regroup, and, and rethink it earlier rather than stubbornly later. That's much stubbornly well, later. Well, those are good. Those are five good. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Yeah. So I, I couldn't hear everything you said, but I know you said you're talking about barter. Yes. And the question is barter versus money. And then are you asking about legal implications or tax implications? Okay. From, from a legal perspective, it doesn't, it, it makes, it, it almost always makes no difference. So huh. I have accepted many a pig in exchange or other farm product in exchange for legal services. Wow. I report it as income and uh, <laughs> because I'm a Girl Scout that way and because it's the law. You know, they're just because it's not money doesn't mean it doesn't have value and you're expected to report it on your taxes and it still counts as income and it still counts as a regulated activity by the farmer. Oh, in health laws, uh, is there any technicality whether you barter? Oh, I see. Uh, for, for like, like in commerce, I mean, right. the, in commerce is the operable. So typically, no. I mean, the, most states, there are a few exceptions, but most states phrase their laws, their health laws, um, and egg commerce laws in terms of sale or distribution. So, and they do that to catch that kind of a loophole. There are, you know, there are a few exceptions to that. It's a, and it's the same with the donation concept. Some people say to me, well, what if I just put out a jar and I'm accepting donations for my milk or my other products, and then I'm giving it away free, and they put the donation in the jar. 
in most cases, that's really not going to cut it, because, particularly if the donation, if the suggested donation happens to be the retail, the fair market value or retail value of the product. That, you know, the government is going to challenge that as a scam and, you know. My, my problem with the donation, and I've always loved that, I mean, you know, just philosophically, my problem with the donation, though, is if it's real, if it's really a donation, then if somebody came and wanted to take all of it for nothing, they could. They could. And, and if I said, oh, no, 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 uh, it doesn't work that way, then suddenly it's not a donation. And, and I get tripped up. That I've always been scared of that, um, for that for that reason. Because it's okay to push the envelope, but you have to push the envelope consistently. For example, we, we have customers in the um, southeast of Maryland, um, Annapolis, okay, and... Um, and we, we take food up there, we take our uninspected chickens up there across the state line, but everybody's bought it and paid for it at the farm on the internet before we deliver it up there. And, and uh, so our position is it's a Virginia sale and we're just taking a product that's already been sold in Virginia. Well, Maryland does not have sales tax on food. Virginia does. We charge Virginia sales tax on those, on that sale. And of course, some of the customers, they complain about, whoa, wait, we, we don't have food sales tax, but you don't understand. This happened in, this sale occurred in Virginia. That's the kind of consistency I'm talking about. Now, we might be wrong, and, and I'm sitting here. No, you know, I think you're we, right. We, we might be wrong. But, but the point is, it's okay to push it, but you have to live, you have to go to bed at night living with the consistency of whatever you're pushing. And, and, and if you can't make a case for yourself to be consistent in the push, you're, you probably should change what you're doing and at least get to where you can have a, a, a whatever, a, a, a cogent argument, a consistent persona of, of what you're trying to do. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, Joel, you're the one that brought it up, but... <laughs> Yeah, in general, you know, um, when you're talking about a risk and in terms of what I've seen in lawsuits, generally a million dollars per incident and two million in the aggregate would be about, I think, the, the norm for what's purchased. Uh, but Joel, what do you think? I, well, yeah, I, you're a bigger operation. Yeah, well, generally, yeah, generally, I mean, I want as little insurance as necessary. Just remember that your chance of being sued is in direct relation to the amount of insurance <laughs> you have. So, so the more insurance you have, the higher chance, the bigger plum you are. I mean, that's just important to remember. But secondly, I think in, in, in practice, um, your, your customers will determine what your insurance is. And so as long as we were just selling to individuals, we had one level, it was low. But when we, when we um, got requests to service a, like a VA hospital to go on a U.S. food services truck, things like that, institutions, then suddenly they define what you have to have. And then you have to decide, do I want to go that way or do I not want to go that way? And so a lot of times your actual customer will determine, will, will, will ask for some sort of a of an insurance, I mean, what do you call it? A, a certificate of certi insurance. A certificate of yeah, insurance. Yeah, the contract will require a minimum. That, that will have to meet, meet a benchmark that, that their underwriters have, have determined for them. Okay, everyone, we have to go ahead and wrap up. The timekeepers are telling us to. Uh, would you each like to tell everyone where they can find you after this? If you want to contact me on the internet, go to uh, chickensandyou.com. And then you can get links from there. So. And for us, of course, you can look at polyface, polyfacefarms.com, our website, to see what we're up to. And Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, just Google that and you can find a yeah. find the great group. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. You just listened to a conversation between the friends of Mother Earth News. If you're interested in learning more about what you've heard in this episode, visit MotherEarthNews.com slash podcast for more information and resources. You may also find links from this episode in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and stay up to date through your favorite podcast provider or our website, MotherEarthNews.com slash podcast. Please rate and leave us a review and let us know what you think of the show. 
Give us a share so that we may continue sharing our friendly conversations with you. If you would like to get in touch, please send your mail to motherearthnewspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for joining us. I'm podcast producer Charlotte Brunin. Our podcast production team includes Haley Casey, Jessica Mitchell, and Robert Riley. Zach Slayton provided our music. The Mother Earth News and Friends podcast is a production of Ogden Publications.